Hello friends, I'm Ashish Dabari, founder and CEO of Axamize, and to our new listeners, welcome to our old ones, welcome back. Okay, so next week is the RISC V Summit, the annual conference on RISC V, which is starting on December 8th. There are lots of opportunities to join it, especially this year. It's being held virtually, and therefore you can join it from any part of the world. And Risk Five International is offering great prices at massive reductions. So I would encourage anyone and everyone who's interested in anything to deal with processors or Risk Five to go ahead and take this opportunity to listen in. And we will be talking about coverage-driven sign-off for Risk Five. So that brings me nicely to today's topic. So I will be talking about coverage and what coverage really means, especially if you were using formal verification. You know, coverage is a term that is conventionally used in dynamic simulation-based verification. And there are two well-known forms of coverage that people uh, know when they are using dynamic simulation, which is code coverage and functional coverage, often called as feature coverage. And, and most of this coverage-related discussion uh, took off in the context of constraint random verification. And really, nobody was talking about that much uh, coverage in the times of directed testing. In the context of formal verification, coverage has been gaining a lot of discussion points uh, in the last few years, especially because people are no longer satisfied knowing that properties have been proven or they have been left unproven, as in they were inconclusive or bounded proofs, as they're often called. So, of course, if the properties fail, one can debug them and figure out if it's a design issue or a testament issue, or indeed a specification issue. But when it comes to figuring out whether we have covered everything necessary for signing off a verification task with formal methods, what has been largely missing is a holistic view of understanding in all respects whether we have truly covered everything we need to cover. So in Axomize, we have been having a lot of introspection about this and understanding ways of solving this problem. So before we actually solve anything, we need to understand what this problem really is. So in my view, it's a six-dimensional problem. It all starts from requirements and understanding what aspect of requirements and specifications were implemented in the hardware and what was then verified against those requirements. And actually, that has been a solved problem to a large extent because one can define requirements and one can observe uh, by running the properties and formal tools, what has or hasn't been verified. But that isn't the whole story. And especially when uh, proofs don't conclude and you're left with inconclusive proofs, um, then it's even harder to say what has or hasn't been done. And now there are complementary, often competing uh, methodologies. So for example, somebody talks about mutation coverage as being one idea. The other person would say, we can use proof core and cone of influence analysis. So what I want to do today is to just take a holistic view of this topic, right? So by the way, if you want to listen more on this, as I said next week, uh, my talk um, is, we'll discuss this in more detail in the context of RISC V processors. And actually on December 4th, I'm giving a keynote in an internal conference at Intel so, um, you know, if you are at Intel, you can certainly listen to this, but uh, otherwise, RISC V Summit next week. Okay, so what is it in a, in, in a nutshell? So I think what we need to do is to start this whole thing from understanding what the requirements really are. So that define the coverage target. And that is usually a qualitative task because you can define a whole laundry list of things to do. We're going to verify your processor, so we're going to verify the microarchitecture, we're going to verify the architectural compliance, we're going to verify deadlocks, we're going to study uh, whether or not interrupts are verified, you know, debugs work correctly, um, whether or not there are X issues, whether the processor works correctly with respect to bus interfaces. So you can have a broad 
collection of overall requirements. And that is what I mean by coverage targets. It's a collection of target checks uh, that we would like to achieve. Now, the process of formalizing it comes next and the efficiencies of whether we can model things more efficiently so we can get them to convert is a separate discussion. That's not what we're talking about today. But having formalized a bunch of requirements into properties as assertions and covers, we can then run them in any formal tool that you have at your disposal. And what you then get is assertion coverage. So we start off with coverage targets, which is number one. Number two is assertion coverage, which is simply an insight into a dashboard view uh, from any formal tool. And you just look at it visually or from a log file to say what was proven, what was failed, and what was inconclusive. And by fail, I mean um, those assertions who also fail the equity check. Now, that is the easy bit. The hard bit comes in when we want to understand that the collection of properties that were formalized, were they enough to check a specific requirement? So for example, let us talk about a load store unit of a processor. So a load store unit intuitively is meant to read and write data uh, from the memory, but now it comes with lots of different variants. So for example, you would have aligned address lookups, misaligned address lookups, you could have exception handling, you would want to know if you are actually reading and writing at a specific address or not. Uh, can you have back-to-back -back loads in the stores? Uh, if you have a weekly ordered processor model, uh, then there are other interesting uh, requirements that come. So depending on what the architecture and the microarchitecture specification is, for a given requirement to verify a load or a store check, different collection of properties would emerge. Having coded these properties, we would still like to understand if they actually cover the space of everything that is related to load and store. So there are def different ways of actually finding these things out. So for example, one of them, as I said, is mutation-based analysis that you can actually discover either a known bug, um, as in a handcrafted mutation or an automated insertion of a mutation, and again, this whole checker completeness is a qualitative analysis. There's no metric here right now to say how complete your checker really is. Okay, so this is an important point that I would like to make here. Now, there are, of course, other techniques here as well for checker completeness. And as I said, you know, we can go into more detail. Certainly join in next week, uh, Lewis 5 Summit talk. Let's talk about the fourth dimension here, which is even more difficult than the previous three. The coverage targets being number one, accession coverage being number two, checker completeness being number three. Overconstraint analysis is basically asking the question whether we are letting our checkers do their job. Are our checkers verifying everything that they are designed to do? Or are we actually blocking good stimulus by having bad constraints in our verification environment? Now, as most of you know, formal verification doesn't need any handcrafted stimulus. But by the way of constraining things, putting assume properties, for example, you could block out legal good stimulus. Having assume properties is just one way of creating a bad constraint. Bad constraints can come from many different sources. You can have bad design code, which means uh, if then else's, which can actually prevent the design from being hit. Now that's not an artifact of verification error, but it still is an over constraint because that bit of the design would not be hit. But that is not what I'm actually talking about when I'm thinking of over constraint in the context of verification. You could have over constraint coming from your own formal verification test bench because if you're using glue code, um, then that can introduce it. If you're having a very tight antecedent um, and you have lots of different and terms in the antecedent, they could block some interesting behaviors from being triggered. If you have a very loose consequent in the property, then if you're checking for things that are not necessarily related to the actual behavior, and they could be true anyways, regardless of the antecedent, that could actually 
be an over constraint as well in the sense that you've now reduced your ability to see through the bug space by having a proof when you shouldn't have. And effectively, what over constraints do is to produce a false sense of security. You end up having a proof when you shouldn't. And you will think you've actually verified everything and you've not. So again, it's a complex topic. By the way, we also covered all of these in our formal verification training classrooms uh, where we go in depth into all of these. Let's talk about uh, the number fifth dimension, right? So the fifth dimension is property driven design coverage. Now, this is a great tool related feature that comes with uh, most formal verification tools. Most recently, we've used this in great detail with Cadence's Jasper Gold. And, um, and in fact, Mentor's Quest or PropCheck has a solution, uh, which is also quite good. What these tools do actually is they, they give you the ability to calculate what aspect of the design was structurally reached or covered when a given checker was being verified. So they, for example, Jasper Gold, what it would do is you run a property and then if the proof is taking place, it's get calculated and if you have coverage enabled, then it would calculate all of the metrics about which design lines were reached, what branches were hit, um, toggle coverage, expression coverage. This gives you a great visibility at a very, very economical uh, price. You don't have to do anything other than just run the tool when your properties are being run, and the tool gives you great insights about these lines were reached, these lines were exercised, they were not exercised, and this exposes you know, any blind spots that you may have. For example, if you've not written a property to actually verify a certain behavior in the design, and that behavior is implemented by certain design lines that are not reached, then you would just find that information. So this is great. So this is a metric-driven way of actually uh, obtaining a good sense of how much you've covered. So whereas the session coverage, our second dimension also provides a metric oriented view. The property-driven design coverage is also providing that view. And I'm talking about a concept here. I think the Cadence uh, team calls it formal coverage, um, you know, stimulus coverage and, and checker coverage. Other tool vendors will call it with different names, but the concept is, is what I'm talking about. And the last one, the sixth dimension, is scenario coverage, which we discussed in our previous podcast, which is that ability to establish that not just as exhaustive proofs are happening, but actually specific interesting scenarios are also possible to visualize. And that we can also prove that those scenarios will always happen as we expect them to happen. Scenario coverage expects the user to specify interesting scenarios in some form of a spreadsheet or, or a CSV file. And what we then do, for example, in our Axamize formalizer app in the context of RISC V processors, we synthesize a specific interesting scenarios and then we prove them in any formal verification tool that you may be using. And that exposes really interesting corner cases, blind spots in verification. And this is a great way of actually understanding and having a conversation with a non-formal guy to actually um, say to this person, look, these are the interesting scenarios that we've verified. You can go back to your manager and said, we verified that these instructions work correctly all the time exhaustively, but we also verified the specific interactions of stalls, of interrupts, of debugs, back-to-back -back transactions. And we can show you that these properties were actually tested. So this whole concept of, of scenario coverage is producing evidence and the properties are countably many. So you can count them. Again, it gives you an idea of metrics, how many were proved. So this is qualitative as well as metric-oriented view, but you can actually see for yourself how many of these specification entries in your spreadsheet were actually proven or not. 
And together, all of these six dimensions have to be used to understand whether or not the verification is complete. As I said, if you're interested in this topic, we can have follow-on discussions and conversation points. We, we can help you with training where we discuss these things. And as I said, next week in the RIS-5 Summit, we'll be talking about it. If you are at Intel, then you may be interested in listening into a keynote talk that I'm giving this Friday in the Intel India Formal Verification Day. Okay, friends. So I hope you like this. and uh, We'll come back soon. For now, uh, stay safe wherever you are.